We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Biological invasions are familiar to many of you, I'm sure, either through personal experience or reading media accounts about uh, the latest biological invasion. Despite the familiarity uh, with this phenomenon, I wanted to start off talking about invasions in very general terms. Biotic invasions can occur when organisms are transported to new, often distant ranges where their descendants proliferate, spread, and persist. A key word in this definition, of course, is transported. Humans are the active agent of dispersal, carrying organisms across biogeographic boundaries that those organisms uh, weren't able to cross on their own. Introduced species are known by a number of terms, including exotic, alien, non-indigenous, non-native, weedy, and pest. The term invasive, however, is used carefully by invasion biologists and is usually confined to cases where an introduced species becomes abundant, spreads widely, and has measurable environmental impacts. Most ecologists would agree that the field of invasion biology started with the publication of The Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants by Charles Elton in 1958. Elton was a prominent English ecologist who studied population fluctuations and the structure of food webs and during World War II gave a series of broadcasts on BBC Radio where he talked about environmental harm caused by biological invasions. After the war, he collated this information uh, into a book, uh, which he published in 1958. And this book largely anticipated the field of invasion biology. Elton passed away in 1991, uh, so he was never able to see uh, the impact uh, of his important book. Invasion biology as a field uh, grew tremendously in the 90s and 2000s and remains an important part of ecology. Biological invasions are multi-stage processes, and in my talk today, I'm going to discuss each of these stages uh, in turn. Uh, species that are uh, transported by people to new environments of, are, of course, native somewhere, and many of those introductions fail to establish uh, the minority that do uh, sometimes spread, and those species can cause environmental impacts. Given the arrangement of the Earth's continents, uh, the biota found uh, in different terrestrial environments is distinctive. And this was first brought into focus by Alfred Wallace, the famous English evolutionary biologist, who in 1876 uh, published a book on uh, the biogeographic realms uh, of the world. It's possible, for instance, to compare habitats in the Nearctic to habitats in Asia, and even, those, even though those habitats may look outwardly similar, uh, the organisms that make up those ecosystems uh, are very different from one another. And this is a consequence of uh, the separation of these continents, long periods of evolutionary time, and speciation. Humans began uh, their migration out of Africa uh, many thousands of years ago, and migrations throughout the world by humans uh, carried domesticated plants and animals with them over 
many millennia, but it's really only recently that uh, globalized commerce and high-speed travel have led to species being introduced at rates that are uh, completely unprecedented. Invertebrate species such as insects shown here and marine invertebrates are oftentimes unintentionally introduced and uh, stowaways in uh, transportation. Uh, marine invertebrates, for instance, are oftentimes uh, carried in marine ballast water. Uh, insects uh, hide in all kinds of uh, commerce and are spread throughout the world at a currently a very high rate. Uh, in contrast, uh, many species of plants and vertebrates tend to be intentionally introduced, and some of these introductions can uh, go awry and cause environmental impacts. The rapid increase in the introduction of non-native species uh, is evident from this graph that was published by Simberloff et al. about 10 years ago. It shows the, an 800-year history of mammal introductions into Europe and New Zealand, and you can see that in the late 1800s, uh, the rate of introduction uh, increased greatly. Another thing that you can note from this graph is that in New Zealand, uh, the rate fell off at, at some point in the 1900s. The people in New Zealand uh, realized that biological introductions uh, were sometimes environmentally harmful and took steps uh, to limit new introductions and to, to uh, try to manage introduced species that were already established. One of the interesting aspects of biological invasions is that most introductions fail. This phenomenon is uh, well studied in intentional introductions where information about uh, the number of individuals in a particular introduction event and the timing of an introduction event uh, are often recorded. For unintentional introductions, which represent uh, a large number of biological invasions, uh, it's impossible to know uh, why introductions fail because uh, the invasions uh, took place, or the introductions rather took place um, without uh, anybody knowing about the introductions themselves. Another generality about uh, biological invasions is that most established introductions fail to spread. And even those that do spread, only a minority uh, become environmentally impactful. Spread is a fascinating process that combines uh, population growth and individual dispersal. This is a map of the invasion of North America by the European starling. Starlings were introduced repeatedly in the 1800s into the northeastern United States. And only after several introduction uh, attempts did a population establish, uh, but it quickly spread um, throughout the 20th century to occupy uh, most of North America. The regular pattern of invasion by introduced species has inspired mathematical biologists uh, to try to predict the rates of spread based on population growth and measures of individual dispersal. Introduced populations can themselves serve as beachheads for the establishment of other introduced populations. And this pattern is nicely illustrated by uh, Harmonia axiridis, which is a ladybird beetle used in, in biological control. Ladybird beetles uh, consume aphids, which are agricultural pests. This species is native to uh, Eurasia and was introduced into North America. And those North American populations, based on DNA variation, are believed to be the source of introduction to other introduced populations. And this global jump dispersal uh, makes it difficult to predict the large scale pattern of invasion exhibited by introduced species. Non-native species interact with native species uh, in a variety of ways, including competition, predation, uh, parasitism, and disease. And the most damaging of invasive species can alter species composition uh, reduce biodiversity, compromise ecosystem services, and transform ecosystems. Biological invasions also combine with other forces of environmental change, such as land use intensification, habitat loss and fragmentation, and climate change. And a challenge of invasion biology is to isolate the independent effects caused by invasions themselves and those that are a result of interactions with other forces of environmental change. I want to talk about several examples of uh, highly damaging invasions, uh, not to uh, lead you to conclude that all introduced species are incredibly harmful, 
But to emphasize the point that some biological invasions can result in large environmental impacts. An example of this type of impact are grass fire cycles that result from uh, the invasion by uh, non-native annual grasses that can transform ecosystems through positive feedback loops resulting from uh, the flammability of grasses and uh, their ability to sustain fires that kill woody vegetation. And grass fire cycles are an important problem throughout semi-arid ecosystems in many parts of the world. This may be especially true in the western parts of North America. Large portions of the Great Basin have been converted from sagebrush steppe to grasslands composed primarily of cheatgrass and other non-native uh, species of grasses. And the Mojave Desert is also susceptible to grass fire cycles as well. The Dome Fire, for instance, in 2020 uh, is believed to have consumed more than 1 million Joshua trees. And this fire was uh, sustained by red brome and other grasses uh, that uh, can occur commonly in parts of the Mojave Desert. Vertebrate invaders can also be environmentally disruptive. This figure comes from a meta-analysis published by Doherty et al. in 2016 that shows the ability of different vertebrate invaders uh, to reduce the populations of birds, mammals, and reptiles, and also to drive those species uh, extinct. And you can see that cats and rats figure prominently amongst these vertebrate invaders and uh, have a variety of uh, effects on uh, the native biotas where these species are introduced. The impacts of biological invasions can be hard to predict. And an example of this kind of surprising change that results from uh, biological invasions is illustrated by the work of Carolyn Curley and Don Kroll and colleagues who studied the effects of rat introductions in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. The diagram on the left shows the food chain on Howadox Island uh, in the presence of rats, which were introduced into Howadox Island several centuries ago. Rats led to the local extinction of gulls and shorebirds, which are important predators of grazing intertidal mollusks that feed on intertidal algae, seaweeds in other words. And the presence of rats has a strong negative indirect effect on algae and those rocky intertidal ecosystems in the presence of rats become dominated by invertebrate animals. The removal of rats from Howadax Island um, led to the recolonization of this island by gulls and shorebirds. And those uh, recolonists uh, fed on uh, grazing mollusks, which led to the restoration of rich algal communities in rocky intertidal habitats. So in this case, the birds had a positive indirect effect on algae in the rocky intertidal. My own work on invasions is uh, in a similar vein. I work on ant invasions and have been studying the effects of Argentine ant invasions in particular on the Channel Islands off the coast of Southern California. We've documented the displacement of uh, native ants on Santa Cruz Island, and that's shown in the bottom left. And I've been working with the Nature Conservancy and the National Park Service on Santa Cruz Island in an island-wide eradication of the Argentine ant. We're now in the post-treatment monitoring phase of this eradication, uh, which appears successful. And we're uh, carefully quantifying uh, the recovery of native ant communities uh, following the removal of the invasive Argentine ant. Island ecosystems, um, whether in the Aleutians or off the coast of Southern California, provide examples of ecosystems that can be restored if uh, invasive species can be eradicated. And uh, these kinds of research efforts uh, are promising uh, because they uh, can be used to study not only the effects of invasive species, but also the ability of native ecosystems to recover following the removal of those species. The costs of biological invasions are enormous and they're also growing. These may seem um, to be obvious points and a challenge in invasion biology is to carefully quantify uh, the costs of biological invasions more precisely. A recent paper published in Nature by Diagne et al. Uh, attempted to estimate costs associated with biological invasions. Uh, this figure shows the top 10 
uh, introduced species uh, in their study in terms of cumulative costs. And you can see that, that some of these species have uh, very costly impacts in the environments in which they're introduced. Another point in this paper, however, is that every time a new introduced species is established um, outside of its native range, that adds to the costs of invasion. And uh, Diagne et al. were able to use this principle to show um, estimates of how both damage costs and management costs were steadily increasing over time. So the damage caused by invasive species is enormous and it's also growing. So in order to limit uh, the harm caused by biological invasions and to, to decrease the rate at which um, the cost of invasions is increasing, it's very important to focus on uh, early stages of invasion. Remember I emphasized that um, while eradications on islands may be feasible, on continental ecosystems uh, they're often infeasible, and invasive species that persist uh, can require long-term control, which is almost always very expensive. Countries like Australia and New Zealand have adopted a proactive approach that has resulted in limitations on the harm caused by biological invasions. And this cost-effective approach uh, involves uh, regulations on trade, inspections of commerce, and rapid institutional responses uh, to emerging threats. And while these uh, policies uh, can be unpopular to implement, um, those countries have illustrated that they have uh, benefits in terms of limiting the harm caused by biological invasions. I'd like to thank uh, CARTA for uh, inviting me to speak in the symposium, and I'd like to thank you for your attention.